Good morning, Redeemer. We hope you are well. As this time of pandemic and of waiting continues on, we pray that this time, this time worshiping God in a sense together, worshiping God as we look to his word, as we read his word, pray through the word, as we sing it, and as we kind of rehearse, um, uh, practice, and, and live through and remember this, this gospel story, that all of this would be a great help to us as we live through this time, that we would be both um, built up, encouraged, and challenged, and shaped by all that, we, all that we do and hear and sing today. So we're thankful that you are watching and pray that you are blessed. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 29, 1 through 4. Ascribe to the Lord, all heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Let's pray. Lord, you are worthy of praise. You create the heavens, the earth, and all their inhabitants. You alone did this. Lord, we hear your call to praise you. We are thankful that though we are weak, you are welcoming. And though our iniquities are great, you remain inviting. This morning, may your spirit help us to turn from our worldly distractions. May your spirit calm our restless minds and subdue our unending hearts. Please, Lord, focus our hearts, minds, and the action to honor and adore you, for your glory and our joy. Amen.
when we gather together, we remember and, and again, we rehearse the good news, that good story. But of course, there, there is no good news in the gospel without acknowledging first the, the bad news. And so we, we must acknowledge in light of God's goodness and perfection and holiness, we must acknowledge our sin before him, our sinfulness, even, even now um, for the Christian who has been saved and redeemed and is being sanctified, is being changed more to the image of Jesus, there is still the presence of sin in us and around us. And so because of that, we, we must be um, continually repentant. So would you please pray with me? O oh, most merciful Father, do not consider what we have done against you, but what our blessed Savior has done for us. We ask that you would not consider what we have made of ourselves, but what he is making of us for you, our God. O oh, that Christ might be wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption to every one of our souls, that his precious blood may cleanse us from all our sins, and that your Holy Spirit may renew and sanctify our souls. May he crucify our flesh with its passion and lust and cleanse all our brothers and sisters in Christ across the earth. O oh, let, oh, let not sin reign in our mortal bodies, that we should obey it in its lust, but be made free from sin. Let us be servants of righteousness. Let us commend our hearts to you and let all our ways be pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we just prayed in our prayer confession, Jesus is our sanctification and our redemption. But not only that, we are also, through Jesus, free from condemnation. As Romans 8.34 says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who was at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Now, Jesus is interceding for us. He is our, our mediator, somebody who, in a sense, stands between, making peace between us and God. The thing that we could could not do for ourselves, he has done for us and is doing for us. And so let's sing this beautiful song about that beautiful truth.
Right now, the world seems to be changing. Every day, every moment. It's a, it's a time where we can be so easily tempted to believe in other stories, other realities, where other, other truths are, are calling out for our allegiance. It's a really good thing, though, to remember, proclaim, and affirm our, our belief in, in, for us in, in a person, in the person of Jesus. This is his story. We belong to him. He is our king. He is our, our, our orientation of, of reality. And with these beautiful words, of the Ligonier statement on Christology, we get to remember and proclaim and affirm all those wonderful things. So let's read this together. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. This is something that we often mention when we are in the same room together. So it certainly bears repeating now. While we um, live, um, in a sense, apart through such a uh, difficult and even divided time, that we belong to one another. Through Christ, we are now brothers and sisters, one family. And so it's so important now especially to practice peace, to take time to um, offer signs of love and peace, to make peace with those um, that you have been uh, g given to, to your brothers and sisters. So we are really thankful for this time. And matter of fact, we keep extending this time um, as the weeks go on because it's such a it's a thing that we so deeply miss um, and we so deeply enjoy. And so we hope that it is a blessing to you um, and something that you are thankful for, not just the time, but the actual peace that we now share with one another. And so let's again to use the, to use that word. Let's practice that. Let's reach out to our brothers and sisters, those um, whom we love, those whom we know from, from Redeemer Baptist Church, and offer signs of love and peace, being thankful that God has given these people to you.
Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide in every change he faithful will remain be still my soul be your best your heavenly friend through thorny joyful end be still my soul your God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past your hope your call Nothing shake Oh now mysterious shall be bright at last Be still my soul The waves and wind still know His voice who friends depart and all is darkened in the veil of tears then shall you better know his love is hard who comes to sue your sorrow and your fears be still my soul your Jesus can repay from his own fullness all he takes away be still When we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joys be still my soul when change and tears are past all safe and blessed we shall meet at last let's pray Father, we continue to pray for RBC members who are suffering and hurting. We pray for Ricky and his family as they grieve the loss of his dad. We ask for hope and peace in this time. We continue to pray for the Fisters and ask that you would bring healing in Andrew's life. We pray for our members who've lost family members to COVID-19, for Crystal, Brielle, Nathaniel, Kayla, Natalie, and Kate. We also pray for our members who feel helpless and scared as they process through the recent killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. We ask that you would remind them of your love and care for your people. 
Remind them of the justice you will ultimately bring. Remind them of the eternal hope they have in you in the, in the midst of an unsafe world. Remind us all of the family that we have through you. And may we be devoted to our brothers and sisters in Christ in a way that supersedes any other bonds we have through profession or politics. We also pray for Haley as she deals with so much turmoil right now. We ask that you would provide comfort as she deals with the death of her grandpa, that you would allow her access to her apartment, and that you would provide a place for her to live that would not be a burden. Please give her a peace. We pray for Miko and Heidi as they process through so many decisions in their work in Finland. We ask that you'd give them wisdom and clarity as to what returning will look like, how to engage the people there, where to focus their efforts, and we pray that all of their labor would continue to build your church in that place. Thank you for the fruitful ministry, faithful ministry that you've used, and we ask you that you would use them to continue to be a blessing to the Finnish people. We also pray for Fellowship Baptist Church and Greg Cochran as he leads that congregation. We ask that you would use him to encourage that fellowship to love you deeper and boldly proclaim your gospel to the surrounding community. And we pray for Monty Setzler as he leads Magnolia Church. We ask that you would use the preaching of your word at MAG to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And we pray for Iraq, for the believers there, that, that you would increase their faith even as they're assaulted, abducted, and imprisoned. We pray that you would sustain them, preserve them. We, uh, we pray for the pastors ministering to congregations and communities who are deeply hurting. We, we ask that you would uh, work in the hearts even of the militant enemies of the Christian faith, that God, that you would be merciful to them in opening their eyes and hearts to the beauty and truthfulness of Jesus. And finally, we pray for the lost among us. Help us to be salt and light in a dark world. Help us to boldly proclaim the gospel to friends, family, and neighbors. May our actions reflect our love for you and, and our love for others. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is Hebrews 4, 1 through 13. As we prepare to hear from God's word, would you please pray with me? Gracious Father, we are thankful that you reveal yourself to us through your word. Today, please give us teachable, humble, and obedient hearts, ready to hear what you have to say, and prepared to respond in obedience. Help us to believe. God, our Father, be glorified through the reading, teaching, and hearing of your word. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome, Redeemer family. Good to uh, see you again uh, this, uh, this Sunday. I hope that uh, uh, already <clears throat> as we've uh, gone through our liturgy and sung great songs uh, uh, and uh, prayed and heard God's word read, that you, you were filled with faith. Because that's what this particular text really drives us toward. This text in Hebrews chapter 4 uh, tells us that the beauty 
of God's rest should fill us with fear of unbelief and fill us with faith-filled strivings for belief. Should fill us with fear of unbelief and faith-filled strivings for belief. The beauty of God's rest should drive both of those things. Uh, I um I uh, I I, I want to uh, open up by just maybe a way of illustration. Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, uh, I uh, got spotted out by our high school track coach um, for um, because I my my uh, PE coach said we all run the mile one day, and I ran the mile a, a bit faster than everyone else. And so the the high school coach came and. And, and pulled me out of uh, one of my classes and got me to, to run again so that he could validate the time. And then he, uh, <clears throat> then he said, I want you to run with our cross country team, you know, this coming Saturday uh, at, um, um, I think it was Briarwood uh, Presbyterian's uh, Invitational. And so I, uh, <clears throat> for one reason or another, I, it just kind of, it, it kind of locked me up. Uh, I was I was nervous. I was afraid uh, for uh, you know I'm I'm just gonna make a fool of myself. Uh, I'm, I'm so much younger than everybody. I'm so much smaller than everyone. And uh, so I I didn't really practice at all. I didn't really uh, you know work hard at all. And um, uh, and when I got there, because I was so concerned about how I would be perceived and so concerned about uh, you know about what I would do, uh, um, you know. I just I just blew the race. I mean, I was yeah, I came in almost dead last, and I I'd run routinely minutes minutes uh, faster than I did that race. Um, the beauty of uh, the race, the beauty of uh, the opportunity to compete, none of that appealed to me. I was more preoccupied by my own self perception or by the way that I thought people were. Me. I was my, I was preoccupied by the fear of perhaps failing. Uh, I was uh, preoccupied by all of those things, and those things uh, continued to drive me to the degree that I I I, I, I lost all fear in actually failing at the race uh, because I was so preoccupied with my the moment that I was in, and I also was not uh, you know. Uh, you know, pushed or engineered with the, the, the will to, to strive, to run hard, to, to, to give it my all. I was robbed of those elements of, uh, of fear and striving because I had no portrait of the beauty of God's uh, rest, or sorry, beauty of, of this competition and the beauty of the opportunity to run and race uh, at, at this level. Uh, none of that uh, preoccupied me. I was simply paralyzed with with the, the fear of of, uh, of of looking bad uh, it, no one ever thought that I would actually win the race I was just, I was too small was too young um, running with state level you know kind of uh, racers um, and yet I was I, I didn't none of that ever appealed to me the privilege of being able to do it just never settled in it was I was always I was just preoccupied with just failing um, from the beginning of uh, uh, chapter um, two, uh, you've got uh, uh, in Hebrews this constant reference, constant reference back to Psalm 95, which reflects the historical situation of Numbers 13 and 14 of the people trying to go into the land. You, you have this emphasis of Jesus being greater than the angels, Jesus being greater than Moses, Jesus being the great high priest, the one who uh, has, uh, um, you know, is God Almighty in the flesh blessed forever you've uh you've got uh this uh this god who has um uh provided for us uh by way of sanctifying us with his blood and and this this the beauty of jesus then is compared to this long section of behavior really uh, and this, this sense of behavior particularly always paralleled with the israelites in this historical moment of being able to get right up to the land and then not going in and uh and and so the, the writer carries this on through chapter three into our chapter today chapter four 
And in chapter 4, 1 through 13, we come to the, the end of this, uh, the end of this uh, constant uh, uh, comparison to uh, the Israelites and this constant admonition uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to persevere and to labor and to strive. Um, this, uh, this idea is, is sort of fundamental to seeing Jesus. If you see Jesus as beautiful, if you see anything as beautiful, it motivates you, it motivates you to do some things, to not do other things. And this is exactly what we're looking at here. If we broke our text down today into this outline underneath the auspices of this great idea that the beauty of God's rest uh, should um, pro provide us with fear of unbelief and should give us faith-filled strivings uh, towards uh, uh, rest, then we can break the, our text down as to fear unbelief, rest requires work, and God's word generates faith and energy fear of unbelief rest requires work and god's word generates faith and energy now th this is all remember my racing situation this is all pictured in this we're, we're not today talking about how one earns their salvation through uh, uh through a work so just a, a couple of preliminary a preliminary uh, comment Please remember back when we were going through First Peter that we uh, that we talked on more than one occasion actually about the uh, the connection between uh, or the, the idea of salvation being that you have been saved in the past that you are being saved in the present that you will be saved in the future. So just like any real relationship that you've ever been in, your relationships have a past, they have a present, they have a future. It all engages both memory and hope, but also a sense of striving uh, and, and real energy being pushed towards that uh, relationship. And so this is the idea that we're talking about today. We're not talking about working toward your salvation or, 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 or something in this nature. So, so as I go, I don't want you to, to get confused by that. Um, the fear of unbelief is this first uh, part of our text. Uh, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, should have seemed to fail to reach it, for good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So um, what does it look like? Uh, what does unbelief look like exactly? We'll, we'll, we'll go into that in chapter 4, verse 6 to 11, a, a reference once again back to Psalm 95 and this historical moment in Numbers 13 and 14. But this idea of unbelief is, is really quite serious. Um, if you think about it, um, even within the bounds of the way that we think of uh, sin, we tend to think of sin in really small terms with regard to moments of morality. Uh, whether we say certain things or don't say certain things, what, what we look at or don't look at, what we uh, engage in and fail to engage in. Um, but a real, the real the, uh, thing that you should fear is, is, is the idea of unbelief, because unbelief reflects or portrays something far deeper. It, it reflects or portrays value. Uh, in uh, in God and in His rest. And if you look at uh, this idea of rest uh, that we'll that we'll see, this this rest is is off in the future. It exists in the present, but it's off in the future. Therefore, while the promise of His rest still stands, and then later on uh, you, you'll see that there's still a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There's it. So this is off into the future. So this is part of we have been saved, we are being saved. And we will be saved. This is a part of the portrayal of who we actually are. If, in fact, um, you've genuinely been saved in the past, if, in fact, you're genuinely being saved in the present, then you will look like, you will reflect the energy and the fear of those who are being saved in the glory. That, uh, that idea is, is sort of embedded into the book of Hebrews as well as into so many uh, um, New Testament uh, texts. Because this is just the reflection of, of how we think about um, the value of, of people. We, we think about, you can see the value of people in how people act and, and live. Uh, for example, I've, I've, I've always been fascinated a little bit by 
sort of the, uh, I don't know where it comes from, uh, kind of almost stoic kind of uh, uh, approach to people dying if you're a Christian. There's some I know that there's a, a lack of faith being invoked if you weep or you mourn uh, for people, but that's not, that's not true at all. You should mourn profoundly for people in order to convey the, what they really meant to you. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's painful. I mean, I've done it, uh, you know, with both my mom and my dad. Um, and, and, um, uh, and other people as well. And, and other, many of you have done it, but when we mourn, when we mourn, we convey value, we convey value to people of this person who's passed away uh, in the same kind of way. This writer is saying, Hey, there's a promised rest out there and it's beautiful. And so while it's out there, fear, unbelief, lest any of you should seem to have failed not to reach it. Now that's the, that's the idea of portrayal. If in fact you live a particular way and people can look at you and they see uh, in you this portrayal of someone who doesn't see uh, the rest uh, of, of God is beautiful, then this becomes a, a profound point of fear. And, and, and so fearing unbelief is the, is the thing you should fear. You, um, there, there's, there's not a lot of things uh, you know, to, to, to fear o overtly in the world. In fact, I would say that but particularly now we're, you know, right here in Hebrews uh, two through four, Israel is such a, you know, has commanded the attention of this writer that I would say that if you go back and you look in the old Testament, you can say uh, with certainty that, that, that Israel genuinely has no valid external enemies. They don't have anyone that can actually present a problem to them. Now they, they, they have Pharaoh, and Pharaoh oppressed them. But Pharaoh's really Pharaoh was demonstrated in the in the plagues that he was not their enemy. Uh, he, that, that he could be he could be dominated pretty quickly. The greatest enemy that Israel has, yeah, as as us, I think it's one of the reasons the writer of Hebrews uh, uses it is us. We are the the internal uh, enemy of, of of failure to believe is the biggest problem that we have. Um, you you want to you, you want to to grab grab hold of this yeah and 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 really really embrace it um, because th this is uh, th this is this is exactly uh, how uh, idolatry creeps in so very uh, so very uh, carefully. This is how boredom with uh, with the idea of the gospel uh, creeps in is unbelief. Um, um, all of a sudden. The, the, the rest that's out in front of you fails to be beautiful and you begin to weaken and weaken and weaken. And yet here you have uh, uh, you know, this, this admonition to say, be vigilant about this. So, so this is a good question is how, how many of us are genuinely vigilant uh, about, uh, about this idea? Um, about, because th this is our text, right? Verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest. Um, because the good news came to us just like it came to Israel. Um, it, it came to us in Israel through God's story. It came to us in Israel through sacrifice and through atonement. It came to us in Israel through God's mighty acts. It came to us in Israel through God's voice and experience with God. And, and so it came it, 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 as, as it comes, this isn't that this by itself doesn't save hearing the gospel over again doesn't save you being in church and being raised in church by Christian parents doesn't save you. Um, all of these things, um, intellectually assenting to the faith and saying, Oh, I believe uh, that this is um, uh, legitimate, it doesn't save you. Uh, faith is more than intellectual assent, faith is more than just simply morally determining things. Faith. Uh, for us as believers is seeing uh, the, the, the rest out there that's beautiful and connecting it to uh, being called out of darkness and into light. And those of us who believed, we have entered the rest presently and we're entering the rest into the future. But those of us who have the rest in our eyesight, now our behavior nowadays is altered. So what is the thing that we want to fear the most? And fear the most is unbelief. There are all kinds of things to fear nowadays. I've never seen a country in such uh, disarray. Uh, and yet, for the believer, use all of these 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 ideas. There, there is in uh, systemic incessant systemic injustice in the United States. Uh, there is, uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, this pandemic and and just the uh, the instability that's created uh, socially. The, uh, the massive instability economically that we're going through. There's loads of things to be afraid of. Utilize those things as tangible points 
to where you can say, okay, so well, wait a minute, if I'm most afraid of the economy failing, then what is it out there in front of me that I think is most beautiful? I mean, it's okay to be nervous about and, and afraid about uh, the economy failing, but, but what, are you, what are things that you fear? And, and, and so those, those ideas are the things you want to kind of keep out in front of you in such a way that, uh, that it, it begins to shape uh, the, the, way that you, the way that you think, uh, shape the way that you, you understand things. Um, the, um, uh, the, if you want to see how the, uh, the writer, though, uh, does this, the writer says, okay, I'm going to give you a picture of what unbelief looks like. And so then he begins in uh, chapter 4, verses 6 to 11, uh, to, to walk us through. He says, um, uh, well, well, actually, let's back, let, let's, uh, let's back up a bit uh, to verse 3. Uh, For we who believed enter that rest, and he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they won't enter that rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Interesting that he would say, let me tell you about the Sabbath, and then reiterate one more time, they shall not enter my rest. And then he says, keep on going, and in verse 6, uh, uh, um, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Connected disobedience again with faith. That should be pretty easy for all of us. We, we talk about that quite often. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, Psalm 95, so long afterwards, and the words are already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, Joshua, right, heading into the, the, the land, uh, Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, who have entered God's rest, has also, entered, uh, has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter. Okay, so let's, let's get back. Two things here. First of all, the quality and the concept of God's rest. Rest is a huge thing, uh, and it's interestingly enough, right here in our text, is connected with the law, the prophets, and the writings. This is a full-blown Old Testament testimony. The law, in the sense of the, the reference immediately to Genesis uh, 2 2, and then you can just take the idea of the Sabbath. For example, it's a brief idea of the Sabbath. And on, on the Sabbath day in creation, on, uh, first of all, it's day seven in creation. It's never called the Sabbath, but certainly that's what it is. Day seven of creation, God rests from all these created, which means in the ancient world, when a God would create and they would sit, they would sit because this established them as authority over all things. So part of God's rest is God's uh, celebration, if you will, of his absolute sovereignty over all things material, all things temporal, all things functional. Um, later on in Exodus chapter 16, you find the Sabbath being sort of introduced functionally to Israel. And in this introduction, this was a time uh, when Israel would take its hands off the wheel and they would not go a a out uh, to collect uh, anything and do any work for food. Uh, they would simply uh, take the food that they were provided the day before. They would do what no one in the ancient Near East does uh, during this period of time. They would do no work and still eat. And so each week, the rhythm of each week would culminate uh, with uh, this uh, celebration, if you will, this meal that would reflect that God was completely and utterly powerful to provide. And so God's provision now is mixed into the sovereignty and the idea of the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, you, you, get, you, you get both ideas. You get God's rest and, so, uh, and his sovereignty, uh, like you have in Genesis 2 and Exodus 20. In Deuteronomy 5, you have a reference back to the Exodus. Uh, that, and, and so now salvation, liberation is tied in. So when, when anyone in the Old Testament thinks of the Sabbath, when they think of, uh, this is also why, if you've ever been reading through your Bibles and you wonder, man, why would you stone somebody to death for violating the Sabbath? This is it. The Sabbath wasn't so much a worship day. It was a sign day. It was a, it was a day that said we can rest in the strength and power of God because our God is, in, there's, there's no other thing that causes itself God that's even remotely like this God. 
This God is sovereign over all things material, temporal, functional. This God is powerful and good to provide for his people. Uh, and and uh, this God is powerful to liberate his people. So our liberation, our sustenance, our provision, God's power and his beauty, his absolute sovereignty, all bound up in this concept of Sabbath, all bound up in this concept of Sabbath rest. And the land was this tangible idea, which brings us to the next uh, example. Here's Joshua. Joshua brings people into the land. Uh, but if you read Joshua and Judges, you also find that, that, that it, was, it was an incomplete conquest. Uh, but he brings people into the land. But there's still a rest to be had. And it's really strange because in Joshua chapter 21, you have Joshua stating, or the, the historian stating, that God had fulfilled all the promises made to the patriarchs. Nothing had, had, had been set aside, but everything had been fulfilled. And yet, genuine rest is still off in the future. So just like genuine forgiveness, uh, we've talked about a little bit in the past, we'll talk quite a bit about uh, with regard to Leviticus and, and, and the sacrifices. Uh, genuine forgiveness is, it, while there's forgiveness in Leviticus, Leviticus 4 is over and over again, and you'll be forgiven, you'll be forgiven, you'll be forgiven, but real forgiveness, qualitative forgiveness, is still off in the future. And his coming into the land is rest, but real rest, real rest is still off in the future, which brings us to the writing section, the Psalms, in Psalm 95, where David reflects back onto this historical moment and says, today, so this is a part of Israel's worship. Today, don't harden your heart. There's still a rest off in the future. So Israel is singing about a rest to come in the future. And so when the writer of Proverbs picks this up, he says, okay, listen, rest. This is what you should hear. Rest, you should hear an, an absolute running toward a, a, a belief in God's sovereignty and resting and, and throwing yourself just, uh, just uh, out, out onto God's sovereignty. Uh, God's uh, uh, over everything material, temporal, functional. No matter what happens to you here, no matter what occurs here, that God is sovereign. No matter what occurs here, that God is good to provide. No matter what occurs here, that God has been good to liberate you in the past and is liberating you and saving you in the future or right now in the present and will save you into the future. All these things are bound up in rest. Rest is this, is this state of, of, uh, of believing and knowing all the things you already believe and know, but without any impediment from sin. It's believing and being able to worship without any kind of uh, conflict within yourself. It's, it's, it's being able to do all of these things because you're finally wrapped in the arms of the Savior in a way eternally that, that has no end to it. And this rest is supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to drive you. It's supposed to drive you forward. This is why unbelief, is so frightful. And these moments of unbelief in verses 6 to 11 that our, uh, that our, that our um, uh, writer gives us uh, are, are helpful. God's rest is established in Genesis. He, he, at, at, the, at, at the end of day seven, he is sovereign over all things. And yet, and this is why he, right after in, in our text here in verse 7, he, he talks about, I'm sorry, in verse uh, 6, he talks about uh, the, uh, my, my word, in verse uh, 4 and 5, he talks about the Sabbath, and then he says, but they shall not enter my rest. And I, if, you, if you're like me, the first time you read that, you go, that doesn't make any sense. It's, you see me talking about Genesis, and then, bam, you're back to Psalm 95 or, or Numbers 13 and 14. And so, um, but this is what it is. The, 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 he says, God's sovereignty over all things material, temporal, and functional established in time and space in, in Genesis 2. And, but you shall enter my rest. In Numbers 13 and 14, what did they reject? They rejected God's sovereignty over all things material, temporal, and functional. Um, you move on down for Joshua, uh, or, or, or David rather, uh, appoints a day off in the future that, they, that, they, that they'll have rest. Why? Because all the things we talked about with Sabbath rest, David knew that this was not part of the DNA of Israel at the time. And, but one day off in the future, because of the promise made to David that one of his descendants would reign over all things, uh, because he knew, as, as he celebrated in Psalm 2, that God would place that servant in his holy place and the kings of the earth would bow to him. Because of all this, David knew that off in the future, there's a today. And that today is the day to to turn away from unbelief and to toward rest. And more to the point, 
toward the God of rest. This, this, is, a, this is kind of the thing that drives it. So for unbelief, uh, unbelief looks like uh, this idea of rejecting God's sovereignty. Unbelief looks like this idea of rejecting God's power and provision. Uh, it, it looks like rejecting the idea that now that God has saved you, or maybe even a skewed view of how God saved you. Like, for example, I never heard somebody say, well, whatever it is that you're talking about doesn't really matter because you, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't affect whether I go to heaven or hell. As if that's the, 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 the full on end all of all questions. That's not what this writer is talking about, though. This writer means to convey that rest is off in the future, and this rest is supposed to engineer all kinds of affections for the God of your rest, the God of your salvation, the God of your future, the God of your past, the God of your present. It's supposed to engineer memory and hope. It's supposed to engineer striving. It's supposed to engineer the sense of fear. That to not believe this would be would be horrible. To be it would be hopeless. And, and so, uh, and so this idea is uh, is is driven. Uh, fear is is uh, uh, fearing faithlessness. Uh, one writer uh, uh, notes uh, fear, unbelief in the promises of God. Because as long as you are trusting in the promises of God, you can be utterly fearless in the face of anything, even death. Um, and, and so that, that's, that, that there's no true word spoken. This is the driving force of, of this text. Fear and belief. Why? So, because if any of you seemed to look, so I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, we're asking a question, does Jeff seem to still believe that there's a rest off in the future? Does his life seem to? I mean, what, would be, what would be the mark of that? Well, the mark would be a believing Believing everything about just life being oriented to believing God, that that rest is still out there, that His sovereignty uh, is is already been established uh, back in back in the beginning, and now this sovereignty will carry on all the way into the future, eternity, future. Uh, do I believe in the power and the promises of God? Do I believe in the goodness of God to supply those? Do I believe in the sustaining power of of, of the Triune God? And do I believe that God will carry me? Uh, from the point that he liberated and rescued me all the way into eternity. Those, does my life look like I believe those things? Because someone who believes those things is going to very much look differently. This is the portrait of unbelief here in, in the Bible, this portrait uh, with, uh, with, with Joshua and, and these, these people who bail on going into the land uh, that, that David later on sings about. Um, and, and, and so what does it look like for you? Like, what does unbelief look like for, for those of you who know one another really well? Like, can, can you help each other? We're talking about what does this look like for me? What, what does it look like for, I mean, if you're a church kid, you've probably known from very young, a uh, young age, how to cover. Um, this is the most dangerous thing in the world. This is back to my illustration of being so, so preoccupied with your perception so preoccupied with how people perceive you, so preoccupied with that that you fail now to, to cease to see the beauty of all that rest out in front of you and you're only preoccupied with yourself. At that point, you are profoundly locked in to looking like you're not believing. The most valuable things now aren't the beauty of God's sovereignty, past, present, and future, the, the beauty of God's power and provision from salvation on into eternity, but it's just you. And, and and so this this is a uh, this is a dangerous spot to be in, and so because of this, uh, we uh, uh, we we have to we have to work. Our, our first point was fear, unbelief. Our second point is rest requires work. Rest requires work. We should strive to enter rest, relying on the Word of God. Uh, to God our way. Um, in, in verse, uh, in verse uh, beginning uh, in nine, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken them another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God out in the future. Uh, for whoever has entered God's rest here in the present uh, has rested from his works as God is rested from his. Has, uh, uh, we, we, the, the, the thing that we want to strive for is, is acute end right here. So let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sword of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
So let us strive therefore. So if in fact we've been um, uh, we've been affected so deeply, if in fact we've been uh, affected so deeply by entering into God's rest by faith, then let the beauty of the end of that rest now drive us to labor, drive us to work. Uh, Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear, this other element, and trembling. Why? Because it's God who works in you. Uh, and Romans 11, uh, 20, you stand fast only through faith. So don't become conceited, but fear, right? So there's two elements here. Once again, uh, in, in another text with Paul, uh, and, um, Paul, in both cases, writing to people who he wanted their ethical lives to conform to those who'd really been captured by faith and really had been, their, their, whole, uh, their whole reality had been now, refocus on the beauty of Jesus. And so what does that generate? It's supposed to generate energy. It's supposed to generate striving. Anything that you see out in front of you that's beautiful that you want, you tend to work for. Uh, for example, my, the, the, the race that I talked about earlier on, the, the reason I didn't work was not because I didn't know how to practice didn't, or didn't know how to run. Uh, it was because I failed to see the beauty of, of, of the competition out in front of me. And I only saw the, the necessity of me looking in a particular way, being perceived in a particular way at present. Uh, those, that, those, that, that ugly exchange provides uh, uh, a, a lack of energy uh, to work. But the only thing it begins to, to shape is how do I make sure that I can maintain perception? And that, that I, I feel like that. sometimes that, that really is the thing that, that, that freezes us up. Um, uh, or, and it could be also comfort. Uh, how, how, how do we, uh, like, for example, I, I think that sometimes the reason people don't think to themselves, you know, I, I want to I wanna just sell this aside and go to an unengaged people group is because they hear stories from our global workers and they go, yeah, I, 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 I don't want that. When I turn on my light, I, I want the light to come on. When I turn the AC, I want the AC to come on. My, uh, I don't want people shooting at my, uh, you know, uh, in my neighborhood. Uh, I don't, um, uh, I'm not interested in those things. And so uh, I, I, I need comfort. And, and so when we take our eyes off the concept of the beauty of rest, it, it robs us of energy. And so let us strive, therefore, because of unbelief, the reality of unbelief, because the reality of we might lose the composite picture of the beauty of rest and the beauty of God's rest, then let us strive. Let us labor. Paul talks in other places about running the race. Uh, he talks about, about fighting, boxing. He talks in other places, uh, in Titus 2, for instance, of, uh, of, of grace as a personal trainer, training us to deny certain things and training us to aggressively pursue others. Those ideas are bound up in striving. Is your life uh, made of striving, or do you perceive the Christian life to be one of simply liberty? Uh, because I'm a Christian, I can do what it is that I want to do. Nobody can tell me otherwise, or they're a, a Pharisee. Or, or, or is, is there some sense of striving? Is there, is there an end goal uh, to it that in, to, it involves your liberty, but your liberty is not the end goal? The end goal is the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. Do, do people see the beauty and majesty of Jesus through your liberty? And if that's the case, that's great. But if they don't, if you can't point to people and, and, and know that you have conveyed the beauty of Jesus, that, that might mean that you've been robbed of your energy because you've lost vision for the beauty of God's rest. And so these things are, these are significant. So how do we correct them? Well, in our text, this helps. If, in fact, we, we need to fear unbelief, if, in fact, we want the energy to strive and move forward, then what does that? Right? Beginning in verse 12, the word of God. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature, listen to this, is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So in this text, the, the writer does not separate Jesus as the Word of God from the Bible as the Word of God. If, in fact, the Bible is talking to you, then the triune God. Remember, in the past, God has spoken through the prophets, and now he speaks to us through his Son. So Jesus, the preeminent voice, the preeminent filter through which we read all of Scripture, is now the, the Word of God, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning our thoughts, discerning our intentions. Uh, so we, so this is the idea is we, you don't run away from this. I mean, as soon as I start talking about, you know, Jesus will take the word of God and he'll expose your intentions. He'll expose you because he's alive. And so therefore, so is his word. And so he'll expose actively those intentions. There's a real natural impulse to run away from that. But if in fact, the rest off in the future is so beautiful that it generates in us a fear of unbelief, we'd, 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 rather, not, we'd rather lose anything other than our eyes to see the beauty of Jesus. If in fact, it generates striving, then, then, we are constantly going to go back to the source that constantly provides us an honest assessment of ourselves rather than, rather than crafting an assessment on our own, an honest assessment of ourselves. And so this is what we want. The word of God uh, here uh, provided in the person of Jesus in particular, uh, reading the word of God through the filter of Jesus and being and, and coming to the word of God uh, with the, the, uh, the idea of longing for it, to cut open like a scalpel uh, our heart and our, our thoughts and our intentions, and, and so we, we want to we, we want to throw ourselves on uh, to God's word in that way. Uh, I, I pray that uh, that you would do that, that you would take time this week and you would just simply read God's word. You might say, you know, I, I don't I don't ha- I, I don't have any kind of education. I don't have uh, I, I, or my, my, my degree wasn't in the Bible. I, I, is there a magic way to use the Bible? I'm saying, no, 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 no. This is a living God, right? So just like any relationship, you simply talk and ask God to open your eyes to things. <clears throat> Jump in with us uh, on a daily Bible reading plan uh, that we do. Uh, there's only probably about 35 or 40 of us uh, in the plan. A bunch of us have probably missed you know, days here and there throughout the year. Just jump in right where we're at and, and, and just uh, and read and just ask God to speak to you. Ask God to open up your eyes to who you are. Ask God to open up your eyes to who he is. Because the more you see the beauty of Christ, the more that you'll see yourself more realistically. The more that you see the beauty of Christ, the more you'll fear unbelief. The more you see the beauty of Christ, the more you'll strive. The word of God, living, active, generates this kind of faith and energy. Um, I don't run anymore. Uh, uh, you could probably look at me and tell uh, that. Um, I, I, uh, I, it's not that because I don't value the beauty of, of, uh, of competition. It's because competition is a, a, by, a bygone thing for me. But I still have things in my life that are tangible, uh, like, like, like finishing life well. Uh, like finishing off with my family around me, I remember pictures of my dad and my mom both passing away, surrounded by family, praying for them, singing to them. I remember a beautiful, beautiful picture I'll always have of my dad and mom when my dad was dying and my mom whispering, you know, very private things you know, to him. Uh, I'm sure of her deepest affections uh, uh, in, in his ear. Uh, as he was leaving this life. That's a great way to, to go. Now, if I, if I end up dying all by myself, if I, if I know that I could die like that, right? A, a, a beautiful end to life, then that changes my present, right? Uh, if, I, if I'm striving for it, just, just pick something tangible you can get a hold of in your life that, they, that you can look out in the future and go, that future can be one way or the other. So I, I'm going to, because I want it to be this way, I'm, I'm going to alter this. Uh, and, and, and so in the same kind of way, Say, okay, if I've been saved uh, from, from, uh, from my own sin, from myself, and I've got this all from my future, and I really believe that, then if I believe that, if I believe that this is all from my future, if I believe this, then I will seem to, I will be genuinely, authentically perceived uh, to, to, to be changed because of my fear of unbelief, because of my energy towards striving for that. Uh, this is all just tangible, practical stuff in the Bible, driving us to see the beauty of Jesus, driving us to see the ugliness of sin, driving us to uh, want to appear and portray the beauty of Jesus for all those watching us, uh, for their peace, because we love them enough uh, to share with them the thing that was most beautiful uh, to to, to our hearts and to our minds. I pray that this is real for you, as I hope you pray it's real for me. Uh, Let's pray. Father, in the name of Christ, I thank you for um, this time and uh, this good word from the writer of Hebrews. Give us grace to see the beauty of God's rest, 
that we might be transformed into fearing and belief, that we might be transformed into uh, striving and working for rest, and that we might be uh, transformed, Father, continually uh, by the Word of God as our source. We thank you for saving us in the past. We thank you that you're saving us all the way into the future. And, and ask that our lives would reflect that, that we believe that. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you, and I hope to see you really soon. Let's continue our responding to God's goodness and love and mercy as we give. And let's do so prayerfully, praying that God would be glorified, made to look beautiful, not just in, in what we give now and, and what that enables, but also in how we give. That God would be shaping us to be, um, in this moment and at all times of our lives, generous people. So would you please pray with me? God, we thank you for your provision, and we acknowledge that your provision looks different um, in different people's lives right now. We pray no matter um, what the case may be, that you would be working in us um, generosity, um, and that our giving would come from a place of, of thankfulness and of cheerfulness. We pray all this through Christ. Amen.
let's spend some time now in silent reflection, reflecting and considering what we've heard and read and, and sung and prayed today. And ask the Lord in this time what he would want you to think, believe, to, to understand, to desire, and to, or, or, or to do about all of these things. Let's ask God how he might shape us more and more into his image through all of this. Amen. Well, church, let's commission ourselves out into the world with the gospel. And again, I know we keep saying this over and over. We know the world looks and even in, in some way even functions differently right now. Um, certainly we function in the world differently, but our, our mission is the same. Our heartbeat is the same. What we are doing in the world, in our homes, no matter where we are, it remains the same. And so we, we say this together to kind of remind ourselves of that, to reorient our mission. So let's read our commissioning statement together. Our Father, since you are infinitely worthy of praise, Jesus, since you are king over all things forever, Spirit, since we believe you can show the hardest of hearts and minds, the beauty of Jesus and the ugliness of sin, we will go into all the world, our world, and we will love the gospel dearly, speak the gospel clearly, and live the gospel sincerely. For your glory, our joy, and for the peace of those who will be saved by your grace because we love them enough to share. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Have a wonderful day. Love you. Miss you. Cannot wait to see you again.